terminated his minister who had here to become full time at, at Princeton, and two years after that he died in his, in his estate with three slaves. Furthermore, the rep the, the Aaron Bird Jr., the Reverend's son, who was an infant at the time his father died, who went on to become, as you all know, the vice president and the man who infamously had a duel with Alexander Hamilton, um, had two children of color. Now the historical record is a little, is a little, the, the mother of the children is well known and she was definitely a servant in his household. What's a little unclear is where she came from. The, the, the story has it that she was a servant from Calcutta, which is a city in India. But no one's quite sure whether that's actually true because they haven't found primary documents. But what they know is that, um, or she could have been from the Caribbean, and, and that no one's entirely sure whether she was an indentured servant or whether she was a slave. And back in those days, sometimes the line was fuzzy. Um, but the children were, grew up to be free people who, who became, who lived in the, uh, who lived in the free black neighborhood of, of West Philadelphia and became leaders, abolitionist leaders. So look that up. So this is, this is the history. Our church goes through periods of time and negotiation. Oh, thank you so much. That's a relief. <laughs> Um, it was it was it was 1905 before women could be deacons in the Presbyterian Church. It was the 1920s before we could become elders, and it was it was the 1950s before women were ordained. And there is in fact a a branch. There is in fact Presbyterian Church of America which is a whole group of Presbyterian churches that splintered off over the or in part over the ordination of women. And to date, they do not have women as elders, deacons, or ministers. So they're not part of Presbyterian USA. We're Presbyterian USA. They're Presbyterian Church of America. Um, so what I would love, and I can't promise that I'll have the answer, but I would love some questions. Did anyone look at read the document in front of me, or did you have any questions? Because I read a whole lot of books that I summarized down to four pages. So. <laughs> yes. As far as I know, not active in this church at, at this time, um, but who knows? Um, we all probably need to do tests. But Princeton University, and it's a fascinating archive. Probably about a decade ago, Princeton, a professor at Princeton University started um, exploring Princeton University's history, um, a legacy, um, legacy with slavery, relationship with slavery. So when I say the church, I mean the whole Presbyterian of the United States. Okay, I'm getting there. Okay. So Princeton University continues to be a press, uh, 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 continues to um, have a, a school of theology that produces Presbyterian ministers. And Presbyterian and Princeton University, as we all know, is just um, down the road from here. And um, they they've been exploring the university's relationship with slavery, and it's called the Princeton Slavery Project. And, in, and they have identified the descendants of the Burr family. And so the Burr family is well known to Princeton University. And in fact, there are Burr family scholarships that the, that the, that the university offers. Next question. In your reading, did you find out, did you see anything, or is there any documented history about uh, any kind of uh, social justice ministries that came forth out of this church to help the community or were we are were we a feeding side, a clothing side, uh, did we help in any kind of way? I know about the Underground Railroad and that part, but were there other any other ministries that were documented that came out of this congregation down through the years? 
My focus was on the first hundred years of the church as we started as congregational and switched over to um, Presbyterian and then and then settled and then, and then disentangled ourselves from from the um, from the what well, started out as a settlement and then the town and the city of Newark. Um, but I think it's very important to say that as far as being a caring community in our early years. The community and the church were one in the same. And, and that, when the, the first handful of people came, there was no separation if you, between the community and, 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 the, and, and the church. And in fact, for decades, the community cared for the church. The community was taxed to support the church. So, like in the... governing entity. The town and the church were the same governing entity. You had, and um, so our first two church buildings were not church buildings, they were meeting houses. They were both city hall and church all in one, and there was no differentiation. Now that didn't last very long. People are people, and we tend to fragment. But even if people started to fragment, and some people just didn't go to church at all, and other people started other churches, the laws were set up that anyone who lived in Newark still had to pay tax to support this church. So some of the pay. You have to pay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It, it was your tax. Your tax went to the government. The government of Newark supported this church. And then over time, that law was still on the books that, 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 that the church had to be supported by a tax. But what they did was they started taxing only church members. So the government was still collecting the money, but they were only collecting it off of church members. And there's records of like big fights. So that's another interesting thing. When the church called ministers, all the citizen, citizenry of Newark, even if they weren't members, got to vote on the ministers. I can't make this up. <laughs> yes, Corral. Hi, I'm actually a, um, a uh, Unitarian Methodist. And uh, I have, on page two, it talks about the Presbyterian journey. Yes. And could you tell us more about the uh, Westminster Confession of 1648 and what that meant for Old First Presbyterian Church of New York? Oh, that, that, that's an ex excellent question, Corral. And um, I'm very, very glad that Reverend Stephen Phelps is in here because I'm probably about to say something wrong if you correct me on this. <laughs> but I will try. Um, We have to keep in mind in history, Protestantism and Calvinism. Our religion comes out of uh, 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 comes out of the, the work of John Calvin. These, the whole idea that 
individual people can come together to form a congregation and to decide how and what format they want to worship God was a radical idea at this time. Absolutely radical. Because in Western Europe at that time was ruled by kings, and occasionally a queen, and popes. And it was top down. Everything was done in the name of the pope, in the name of the king. In the case of the Church of England, the the Church of England had broken away from the Pope, but the King had made himself the head of the Church of England. So, and this, and, and if you lived in the British Empire, you were under the control of, of the King for both your religious life and your civil life. And along came, along came John Calvin and other, other Reformation Protestant leaders. And, and they're putting the power of the people. And, that, that was a hard, and people don't like to give up power. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and there were bloody, bloody civil wars fought over this. And at one point, after a lot of fighting, and this is, you know, I'm being pur purposely vague because I don't have all these dates conquered. The, 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 church, uh, the, 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 the king said, okay, you know, maybe I'll entertain some of this Protestantism stuff. And the, there was a, ministers met in Scotland and came up with the Westminster Confessions. And it was a blueprint for how a church could organize separate and apart from the civil government. And how it could have a bottom up people organization where it starts with the people who elect their leaders who then, and then who elect, and who elect higher leaders in a hierarchy. So as opposed to the king, which is top down, this is bottom up. And the Westminster Confessions got um, got prepared. They got they got accepted, adopted, published, and then there was another civil war. And and the people who follow, who believe in the Westminster Confessions, who who consider themselves Presbyterians, were being killed. And so they went off to Ireland and the U.S. and Holland. And but when you said the civil war, you're talking. England, you're talking about we're talking about within, within England and Scotland. Okay, not here. No, they, 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 you know, so that's what caused, that's what caused people of congregational faith and Presbyterian faith to come to the U.S. I mean, because they, they were refugees. As I said, our story is a story of migration. It's a story. It's a story of the of the of, of people of, of, of people fleeing Free. religious terror. It's a, it's a story of, of, of slavery. It's, a sto it's looking around this room. Many people in this room are from other countries. It's a story of of people coming together under the umbrella of God, but coming from different backgrounds and and, and um, situations. It's a story of migration. Yeah. 
Some churches, the elders are the trustees, and it's not separated. But the leader, the fact, the, the leaders, both the both the um, the or uh, the both the reverends, um, the ministers, get the right word. The ministers are elected. The lay leaders are elected. When the lay leaders are elected, they take ordination vows. Um, um, the, the the elders and deacons do. So we are actually. I'm an elder. And I am ordained. Now that doesn't mean that doesn't make me a minister. We leave that to Reverend Tom. But the ordained office holding leaders. So there's there's two tests. One you have to be ordained, and the other is you have to be holding office currently. Then in turn send representatives to the presbytery. The, and so and that's a that's always a regional aggregation of the churches. The Presbytery then sends representatives to the Synod, which is a, a larger regional aggregation. And the Presbytery also sends representatives to the General Assembly, which is a national aggregation. So it's, it's but it all starts with the votes in individual, ch individual churches. And, and the government goes up from there. But the flip side is, like any governance, governance comes down. We empower the higher levels of government to make certain decisions or to affirm certain decisions. So for example, although we vote on our minister, no minister joins the church until he or she's been called by the presbytery. Mm -hmm. And ministers are not members of the congregation, they're members of the presbytery. And that's right. So, and, and so, you know, and when, and when, a, when there's a search on a formal, um, in churches where there's a search committee, and they search for a minister. It's a joint process between the church and the presbytery. And, the, and in the end, the church votes, the presbytery, the presbytery calls. It's a joint project. One more question? Yes? That's an excellent question. I wish you would tell me. Um, I, I, and I, I don't mean that in a smart aleck way. Um, that's, next, that's next on my reading list. Um, as you can see from this document, I really believe in like searching original documents. I actually bought 150-year-old um, textbooks off of, uh, off of Amazon and such. Uh, but I did not make it to the Underground Railroad era. So maybe if you ask me in three months, I'll be able to answer it. I can partially, I don't know the numbers, but I do know that Morton Street School, which is now closed, that was a part of the Underground Railroad. So I used to work in that building, and there was a sub-basement, and you could, you could uh, go from Morton Street all the way to Penn Station. Yeah. Penn Station was a close also. Wow. It's a lot of history. I think one of the challenges of all this is if you're doing something that's highly, in its time, highly illegal and highly dangerous, you don't leave a lot of records behind. Um, and I really want, I want to stress that New Jersey, as, as Mayor Baraka said, was not on the forefront of emancipation. Um, yeah. New Jersey and the little the early 1800s, I think 1824, but I could be off on that date, passed a law that said that any 
any child born to a slave after that day would be freed at, when they became an adult. Wow. Wow. And and so it, and and so it was. But even here in those years, um, if, if, a, if a runaway slave came into the state and got caught, the runaway slave was sent back. So New Jersey cooperated fully with um, with slave catchers, and then and I, I even less sure of this date, but somewhere in the late in the 1850s, New Jersey um, officially abolished slavery. But it was by a but they didn't because they transferred anyone who was still in slavery because there were people born before 1824 to be um, indentured, um, indef indentured servants um, for an indefinite period of time. So, so it was not until emancipation in 1865 that slavery officially ended in the state of New Jersey. Wow. Well, not really. No. 1866, New Jersey was right. the year. 1866, Reverend? For New Jersey, 1866. Okay, for the you. nation, for the other states, 1865. Oh, so we were here behind. Until after everyone else had. But they also remember the June 10th in Texas. It was two years after slavery had ended that the slaves in Texas didn't know that they were free. Two whole years. And that's why on June 19th, that's why they celebrate Juneteenth as, as the actual day. We want to say thank you to Ellen T. and Sonny for putting together this history. Brothers and sisters, knowledge is power, right? And so that's why we hold community conversations. That's why we invite people to come in because Paul said in his epistles, he said, I would not have you ignorant my brothers and sisters. I don't want you to be unlearned. I don't want you to be stupid. I want you to know, what you, this is what Paul was saying to the churches. And so we have these conversations so that we can continue to learn about who we are and where we come from. So that when we celebrate, we celebrate for real, amen? amen. We got something to be proud of and we have a proud and this church has a proud history. Amen. We have people here, Jeanette said 40 years. Mrs. Daphne Fingo has been here 50 years plus. We have people who have been with this congregation for centuries. Amen. And so we celebrate that as we celebrate a part of our history. And so that's why we bring these educational components to these because we want to continue to learn and to always be learning. And thank you for all of you that shared uh, this rich history. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Take this home. Don't put it in the trash can. This is documented. She has resources. She has references on the back. Take this home. Look this up. Read this. Become learned about this community. Transformation food. Amen. 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 God bless you. All right. All right. And go see the movie Harriet. I saw it Friday night. How many of you seen Harriet? Twice. Twice. Go see the movie Harriet. Amen. Amen. Go see it. It's a amazing. You will love it. Amen. 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 Amen.